All right, so we open the show talking about Nikki Haley. It's her day announcing the presidential run that she said wouldn't happen under these circumstances, but here it is. I thought it was a pretty strong rollout overall. What did you think? Yeah, she's had a couple days, actually. If you think about uh, a release on Twitter of this video that got a lot of coverage uh, because she's solo as far as far as uh, the only other person besides former President Trump in the field. I think the speech was pretty strong, uh, dealt a lot with her history as governor and uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, but also more about a pitch of next generation and a spirit of America and tapping into kind of the optimism pitch of a Ronald Reagan-esque um, speech. So, Yes, I think it was a good launch. She had a good crowd there. Uh, I do think she has an uphill battle, um, and a lot of candidates do, finding their lane, getting their feet, uh, making the Republican Party rally around them as basically the not-Trump candidate. And we've talked about this. I mean, the more of these candidates that are in there— the pie gets divvied up a little bit, and uh, you have to analyze what piece of the pie the former president controls. And whether it's 23 or 35 makes a big difference as far as who's in the race. Big, big difference. And I was struck, this was now a couple weeks ago, Trump hadn't really done much of anything on the campaign trail since his announcement back in November. He was fundraising and, of course, putting out his Truth Social stuff and Spent a lot of energy in recent days talking about Rihanna and the halftime show. But he did go to North to uh, to New Hampshire and to South Carolina for that one weekend. And on the plane, he was asked by a reporter about a number of different would be opponents. And he really laid into Ron DeSantis. He was asked about Nikki Haley. I found this really interesting. Cut 23. Here's what he said. Well, Nikki Haley that? made the statement that she would never run against our president. I believe Mike did too. But my attitude is, you know, if they want to do that, they should do it. I had a good relationship with all of them. Nikki Haley called me the other day to talk to me. I talked to her for a little while. But I said, look, you know, go by your heart if you want to run. She's publicly stated I would never run against him. My president, he was a great president. I'd never run. Did she call you to tell you that she was going to be No, but she called me. She said uh, she said she'd like to consider it. And she was letting you know? And I said, you should do it. You should do it. Go with your heart. He was getting the jab in. She said she wouldn't, but now she's doing it. That was a, a very welcome into the warm water Nikki Haley statement. There have been a few things that the team has put out knocking her. But in that same little scrum with the media... Trump was saying it'd be very disloyal for Ron DeSantis to get into the race. A very different message for him. ABC News story has Trump world sources quoted saying, we think this is good. I mean, she can help split up the not Trump vote, take votes away from Ron. These people getting in will be not taking votes from Trump. They'll be taking votes from Ron DeSantis. I mean, it's not really subtle, the math that they're at least doing internally. Well, I agree. And I, I'm you know, he hasn't held back before, even when it comes to a female candidate, um, you know, in, in his terminology and going after them. But that's also maybe a factor in at least out of the gate. But you're right. I mean, in the polls, when she is in the race and Ron DeSantis is in the race, the numbers come out of DeSantis and Trump's numbers stay roughly the same. Mm -hmm. These are early polls. These are name recognition polls. You don't have any sense of a broad electorate, what they think of the policy pitches, of the pitch about being president from any of these folks. We, you know, are already starting the process of where this race starts in earnest, and that's the primary debates. Uh, and they're going to start earlier this, this okay. year. Okay, how much earlier? Because I, if I recall four years ago, or I guess now even longer— it was because there was no Republican primary, right? So, four years ago, yeah. So it would have been so uh, six in years Cleveland. Ago, Cleveland, the, one of the massive uh, viewed first yes. debate yes. in Cleveland. The Rosie O'Donnell line, me and Megyn Kelly and uh -huh. Chris Wallace. Uh, Twenty-six August? million people. That was August. It was mid mid August. These are probably going to start a month earlier. Probably going to start in July. Oh. And for the longest part. Uh, time people thought that's way too early people are on summer vacation you're not even going to get attention and that august debate was the most watched non-sports event on cable television ever 
And so I think that there is a... You said 26 million people, right? 26 so million people. If there's an appetite, there was. And there wasn't... Um, and that didn't count streaming and, and other things, which will be exponentially viewed this time. So that's the process that's starting. Now, it's some not- of that might have been just to jump in in terms of the huge monster number. There was so much curiosity about Donald Trump. True. How is he going to perform as a real candidate on a real debate stage? You don't think that there'll be curiosity this time as think, the comeback tour? I think there will be massive interest. I'm not sure it'll be... I think we've sort of seen what he does on yes. the debate stage. It won't be a novelty anymore. But it'll be a novelty to see how the other candidates deal with a known factor of That's former true. President Trump. That's true, because the other guys and gals barely knew what to do with him in I mean, think about Jeb Bush. Think about Marco Rubio. Yep. Think about all the nicknames mm-hmm. that they really didn't know how to deal with it um, as it was coming at them back in 2016. In fact, Jeb Bush spent $30 million on Marco Rubio's head. And they, the it's Rubio still team mystifying. spent twenty million dollars on Jeb Bush and, and John Cruz, Kasich, and Cruz and too, John Kasich and, and Ted Cruz. <laughs> so here, here they were fighting each other, and then obviously Donald Trump uh, ran the gauntlet and went up the middle. But it's a different dynamic now. So you know we're in the process of talking about that, as is every other network, uh, about debates and how that's all going to work out. So a month earlier, so we're looking at mid to late July of this year potentially, you can tell me as much or as little as you'd like in terms of the behind the scenes process here, but how does a network go about planning debates like this when they're, as of today, are two candidates only, and as of yesterday, really only one candidate? Do you anticipate other people getting in and sort of make soft reach outs to those teams, or do you just start putting the the pieces in place, and then when people show up or not, you know, they can get back to you, basically? So one, we've been around this block a lot. Uh We've done a lot of these debates. So we assume there'll be other candidates. And really, it's not an outreach to the campaigns as of yet. Uh, The RNC is taking a big, big step here in trying to be more active in this process. And so... um, As opposed to what? As opposed to years past, where it was not as much uh, active in the process early on. so Like demands what can be permitted, you know, timetable, uh, rules? They're going to try to corral the candidates to agree to the RNC format of things uh, and how the debates are going to be structured. It's really in its early stages, um, but... I think that you start talking to different people through the RNC. You start talking to, on the other side, um, if the Democrats are going to have a challenger. They don't think they are at this point, but you want to start that conversation uh, in case they do. Is the operating assumption, just speaking of the Democrats for a second, that Biden is going to announce that he's running for re-election and that he's going to clear the field? Because I... I get it. It seems like all the signs are pointing in that direction. I still just, in my bones, have trouble believing that they're really going to be like, yep, all the eggs in that basket. Again, let's go. I agree with you. And, you know, Ron Klain is signaling that it's a done deal. And he's in this New Yorker article saying, you know, he's going to, the president's essentially going to run again and it's going to all line up and it's going to be Donald Trump who's the nominee and thereby the party's going to say Joe Biden's the only candidate who's beaten Donald Trump. Um, But I agree with you. The president hasn't done it yet. And there is some doubt in the party about whether he's going to be the standard bearer going forward. Well, and a lot of appetite for something else within the party too. And poll after poll after poll shows that most Democrats want it to be someone else, but it's not easy to just, like, say sayonara to a sitting president who wants to run again. It's who almost just, impossible. Who ju- just won a historic midterm election in, in an off year. Right. Uh, you know, it's as close to a win as you might expect or ever expect or dream of if you're Biden because of the underperformance by Republicans. Even with that, though, the base and the Democratic electorate seems to want someone else uh, it seems like the Democrats have a tighter grip over their process than the Republicans do in general. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Brett, I want to shift to this, for lack of a better term, UFO story that continues to develop or maybe not develop, right. as it were. We talked about this on the panel two nights ago. Have we learned anything of substance since then? Other than 
another effort by the defense secretary to say we don't know what the other three things were. There's still an effort to get these things because they're in remote areas. We, are, if they are not releasing pictures of them, you know, which is kind of weird. There has to be um, cockpit video. There has to be some kind of image. Oh, of course. And so why are we not seeing that? Well, they have to like. This is like target the, it. Yes, and then have it in the crosshairs, and then blow it out of the sky. You have to know something. They've they've described the size, the general shape. It just there's something something weird. weird and about this. you know, he Austin said that uh, there's not they're not tracking anything else, and haven't for 48 hours. You know, suddenly we have three of these things that pop up, and we decide to shoot them down, and then they're all gone. Nothing's there. So if it really was, as they're leaning towards weather balloons or research balloons. Wouldn't there be more of them? Uh, you know, it's the whole thing really doesn't add up. No. And um, I think, you know, this will require the president to address it. He has not done it as of yet. And I want to get to that in just a second, but uh, we'll talk to Lucas Tomlinson coming up in the next hour. New York Times story today, multiple administration sources not named saying, well, it could be just totally harmless stuff like, you know, science projects or something. But we blew them out of the sky with missiles like that <laughs> just doesn't make any sense to me. And I just keep coming back to and I'm not a tinfoil hat person. That's not who I am. I'm, I try to be very rational. I feel like the rational conclusion to me is that they're lying to us about something because either they truly have no idea what they shot down out of the sky in three different cases. No idea. We just don't know. We're trying to find it. We can't find them anywhere. None of the three. It's tough. It's just cold. You know, all that stuff. Fine. It's days <laughs> later here, okay? We're the most powerful country in the world. We have no idea what we just shot down in all three cases, or they do know what they shot down, and they're not telling us for some reason. And I find both of those kind of spooky. Yeah, I agree with you. And the fact that we have a lack of transparency and it's <laughs> Karine Jean-Pierre telling oh. us that the president really cares about this issue deeply, uh, deeply cares yeah. about it is um, is it's disconcerting. The skies of Canada. All I know is that from what I've heard is that the things were not just blowing in the wind, and that they there was some kind of control. I mean, they they were not moving um, just by wind movement. So uh, I just some confusion among our pilots how they were airborne was at least something that we've heard. And you cling on to little morsels of something because it's not nothing, but right. you don't know if it's true. Right. So why not just clear it up? Why yeah. not just put everything out there? Why not say, here's what they saw. We still don't know exactly what it is, but this is what they saw. We think it might be this, but we acted in an abundance of caution after the Chinese uh, spy craft, which, by the way, was handled completely differently. Yes. If if they tracked it, as we now know, from China all the way across, and now they say the weather took it different places, that's total BS. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, which is why I think they are lying to us. And look, if they are lying to us, like the best case scenario, in my mind, is that they're lying to us because they know exactly what they shot down at this point, and they don't want our enemies to know what they know. Which is fine. Like, there, there's at least a national security component to that. Where it's like, okay, let's keep them a little bit in the dark and play dumb. Although, I don't know how long that actually is operative. Like, at some, let's say it's Chinese stuff, Chinese material. The Chinese at some point are saying, oh, the Americans aren't this dumb. Right? right. They, they figured it out and they're playing dumb publicly. But in the process, the American people, who also collectively aren't dumb, are looking at this and saying, no, mm -mm. not, not. And then, okay, last point. Uh, you mentioned the president. There's been a push. You asked about it on the panel Monday. Should the president give a speech? And I guess the reports are that they're contemplating a speech. I, would I mean, the like... fact that there's a report out saying they're contemplating a speech is really ridiculous. <laughs> I know. It's news. We're thinking about Breaking it. Breaking news. Something is in our heads. Yeah. <laughs> uh, trial balloon, so to speak. But I would like to hear from the president. But I really don't want to hear from the president if it's just a rehash of nothing like taking John Kirby's points and repackaging them and sitting at the, the Resolute desk or whatever and telling us nothing. If he's going to tell us something, then it's worthwhile. If he tells us nothing, then the president has spoken about it, and he had a chance to today. He didn't. And then you and I are back on special report saying, well, there was no point to that. We didn't learn anything. Yeah, the they whole have to thing's have info. odd. It's all weird. They have to have info. And, um, you know, he could stand to talk about... East Palestine 
Ohio, too. I mean, he could stand to talk about a number of things, mm -hmm. but the real mystery about what they were shooting down with $400,000 Sidewinder heat-seeking missiles, uh, it just doesn't <laughs> add up uh -huh. if it's a research balloon. And the guys in the, in the plane said, okay, we'll take it down. Our guest is a reasonably skeptical. <laughs> Brett Baer, host of Special Report, 6 p.m. Eastern tonight. Chief political anchor working on those debates already. Circle, circle July, your calendar apparently, so buckle up for that on Nikki Haley Announcement Day. Brett, it's always good to see you. All right, see you guys. Let's step aside, come right back on The Guy Benson Show.